Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the State of the Software Supply Chain Report, Planning Tips to Combat the Biggest Cyber Threats in 2023. Just to make you aware, the session will be recorded and will be made available after the presentation is finished, but via email and follow-up. Um, if you have any questions throughout the presentation today, if you please add them into the Q&A section on here and we'll get to them in the Q&A session later on. If there's any questions that don't get answered, uh, we're more than happy to follow up with an email, so, um, just covering anything that we are unable to answer in the time slot today. Um, so now I'm going to pass you over to our today's speakers to introduce themselves and hope you enjoy the session. Hello everyone, my name is Bishop Ras. I'm a senior call engineer at Altavis, uh, which is basically another name for DevOps. Um, I work in um, creating infrastructure and maintaining infrastructure and supporting services for our developers. And yeah, basically everything, you know, the usual DevOps person do. Uh, my name is Konstantinos Vitsis, or KK for short. I'm a principal solutions architect uh, for the EMEA region at Sonatype. So, uh, so do you want to take it off with the covering points? So we will talk about the software supply chain. Um, will you know explain what it is what it does and what are the attacks on it we will also talk about how all the um connected um vulnerabilities and downloads are avoidable what your security teams should be focusing on next year 2023 and we'll also look uh, we'll also talk about how to look at a, you know security properly and not just with the roast into gases And yeah, we will begin actually with a question. So what do you think is the percentage of application in the market which are using the open source? So while you're answering this, let me move to this slide. So to understand why and how to secure your software supply chain from vulnerabilities, first we need to understand what the software supply chain is. Uh, something we at Sonatype we've seen, and I'm sure you all have great experience at, is that as companies evolve to creating software to compete, they realize that the way that we build software has changed. Applications are no longer created from scratch. An application is actually assembled from multiple parts or components. In fact, the application building process can be thought of as a software supply chain and can be managed in a, in a similar fashion to physical supply chains in the manufacturing industry. And like supply chains in manufacturing, software supply chains should follow the same quality principles. You need to source parts from your suppliers, use only the highest quality parts, build quality in from the start and don't pass known defects downstream, and create a bill of materials to continuously track the location of every part. The picture that you see in your screens uh, hopefully might be familiar to some. Um, it's from a webcomic, uh, and the reason why it's so popular is because of how accurate it is. This is your modern digital infrastructure. It is relevant on which industry you are looking at because it applies almost everywhere. Everything is sitting on that one component that is being maintained by someone in Nebraska or you know, somewhere, anywhere in the world, in their bedroom or garage. And if that component suddenly disappears, there will be chaos. Our experience has shown that around 90% of applications out there are using open source components. And it does make sense. Developers don't want to reinvent the wheel every time they work in a project they can reuse parts they used in a different project, or they could go out there and find an open source project that does what they need and implement to their code. Then package the application, release it to the market, or sell it to the consumer. Open source will help deliver features faster, so it will allow the company to increase their profits and accelerate their go to market. So open source is, um, is an important part of the software supply chain. But what makes up a software supply chain? Everyone has a software supply chain. Some organizations or people just call it different names. 
You still have your suppliers, warehouses, manufacturers, and finished goods the same way you have it in the manufacturing industry. So let's dive a little bit deeper on this one. On the software supply chain, what, what makes up the software supply chain? First of all, you have your tools and processes. What you see on your screens is your typical SDLC or software development lifecycle. Components move from one place to another, depending on the need. Developers pull code, pull code from their source control systems, pushing into their CI CD tools like Jenkins, Azure DevOps, GitLab, etc., building the applications with different components from different repositories. The, the CI CD allows them to automate their builds, tests, staging, and finally pushing their application to production. Then we have the personas that they are involved in the software supply chain. On the left, we have the developers that they are upstream building the applications. On the right, we have operations. They are downstream, making sure everything is working as intended and security is in the middle, trying to make sure that applications are developed securely with the right policies in place. Most importantly, making sure security is baked into the applications that they're building and not an afterthought. The ratios that we've seen in the software supply chain is usually 100 to 10 to 1. So for every 100 developers building applications, you have 10 operation people keeping the lights on and one security person. So you can imagine then how much stress this person has. As I mentioned in one of the previous slides, uh, around 90% of the applications in the market include open source. And this is where you have your third party people contributing to your applications, the open source. Of course, this is where risk comes in as well. Let's talk about risk. We've already heard about this from uh, the news outside there. Malicious actors can and will use open source in order to launch attacks into organizations from the software supply chain. And we know how expensive that is. IBM actually released the 2022 cost of the breach report that they mentioned that 83% of the organizations that they survey with this report was breached at least once. And the average cost of each breach was around $4.3 million, not to mention the reputation damage, of course. Some of the notable events that we have identified that they had the software supply chain attack are things like Equifax that happened in 2017, which started with a vulnerability that was discovered in Apache Struts, which is an open source uh, development framework for creating enterprise Java applications that not only Equifax, but thousands of other websites out there use. Unfortunately, this vulnerability was not mitigated and attackers were able to take advantage of it, giving access to the Equifax environment for over 70 days undetected. About 143 million people record were stolen from this attack, which of course brought down almost the whole C-suite of Equifax. And um, figures say that Equifax, this, this bridge costed Equifax around $1.8 billion to clean up, including in compensation to their customers, and of course, being one of the most famous bridges out there. Talking about famous bridges, we also have SolarWinds, which happened in 2020, which happened with the SolarWinds Orion attack. Um, the attack started with uh, threat actors gaining access to SolarWinds internal development tools to inject malicious code into the SolarWinds Orion update binaries. These malicious updates deliver a backdoor known as Sunburst and SolarGate to systems running the Orion platform versions. The impact, well, roughly you had about 18,000 customers which automatically pulled these malicious updates. Another one is CodeCove, which is a code analysis tool uh, which happened last year in April. It was similar to the solar wind, uh, to the solar winds attack. And in this case, the bad actors compromised the code code server to inject their malicious code into a bus uploader script that was then downloaded by code customers over the course of around two months. 
using the bus uploader script used by Kotkov customers and the attackers exfiltrated sensitive information, including keys, tokens, and credentials from those customers' CACD environments. Using these harvested credentials, the attackers reportedly breached hundreds of customers' networks, including HashiCorp, Trilio, Rapid7, Monday.com, and more. And these are just some of the examples in the past years. Different kinds of open source uh, attacks still exist, um, like malicious code injection, namespace confusion, type of coding, and more. So we have now another poll question coming up, actually two together. So this one is more like to know you guys, our audience. So do you use open source software to build your applications? or not and i guess we can see the results um right after people uh, let's give them a minute and let's go to the next one nice so all of you are using open source so what do you think is the increase of the attacks on the software supply chain in the last year? So everybody's here is using open source. That's a great thing to know, but what is the increase that you think that happened? Just in the last year. <laughs> and the answer, is coming up now. So, ah, one of you actually wanted to, make, to, to find, yeah, perfect. So as you can see, as we discussed, right, open source libraries are free to borrow and they definitely drive software innovation faster, right? But they also come equipped with hidden complexity and cost. That leads to the increase of software supply chain attacks, obviously. This is mainly for three reasons, three main reasons. Uh, first of all, not all open source is created equal. Most open source is good, many of it is, is not, and some you definitely wanna stay away from. Second of all, open source libraries age like milk and not wine. In other words, they go stale surprisingly fast and need to be updated over time. And finally, Open source libraries might be secure today, but vulnerable tomorrow. Open source ecosystems are a fertile ground for software supply chain attacks. New zero days are constantly being discovered and exploited. Last year, we reported that the number of these malicious next generation attacks has in had increased to 12,000 known instances. This year, the number of captured malicious packets has continued to increase significantly, and at the time of to, uh, and today, at the time of this presentation, it sits at over 88,000 known instances. This number is derived from verified suspicious packages caught in the ecosystem monitoring that we typically do and excludes packages later proven to be clear. This number is most likely a conservative count uh, as it's compiled from a single source. The actual volume is potentially much higher. But another way to size this up is observed from 2019, the average growth is 442% per year. The average annual growth rate over the last three years is nothing short of astonishing, right? And underlines the need for governmental and industry-driven efforts to curb and defend against this attack. So let's go to another poll question now. So what do you guys think is the one of the most common attacks in the space of open source software? If you've been paying attention, we already mentioned it in the previous slide. Correct. Namespace or dependency confusion is one of the more is one of the risks that's involving open source. 
And this was the most common attack, uh, the most common attack type in 2021, and it continues to be in 2022. This attack vector allows unwanted or malicious code to be introduced downstream automatically without relying on tiger coding or branch jacking techniques. The technique involves a bad actor determining the name of the inner source packages utilized by a company's production application. When they find out about that, the bad actors then publish a malicious package using the exact same name but on a newer version or a much newer version to a public repository, like for example, NPM. At this point, uh, certain pipeline build tools will automatically fetch the newer, intentionally malicious version. In the past year, namespace confusion was alone uncounted for instances of attempted or confirmed supply chain attacks. This attack vector, as we said, it's relying on the Long established conversion in some programming languages to fetch always the latest version of any package. And this all started in 2020, 2020 sorry, uh, when we actually uh, flagged some security research packages that they were posted by Alex Burson. Um, we added them in the next database, but then we see in the space of about half a year or so. Uh, Bearson continuously was posting his packages into the ecosystem. In 2021, in February, Bearson actually released his uh, blog uh, on how he hacked into Apple, Microsoft, and dozens of other companies, which he detailed on how he managed to break into 35 companies using this kind of attack. Now, funnily enough, Less than, well, almost 72 hours later, we had about 300 copycats that emerged after this blog post. Then in uh, 20, uh, February, February 22, uh, 22nd, sorry, uh, we have 575 copycat packages, and then it just blew up, right? Within a span of about a month or so, we had about 10,000 copycats of this attack. Another popular attack is type of um, which just relies into very simple, pick a popular, uh, very simple technique. Um, pick a popular component, misspell the, the, the title of the name slightly, and rely on the assumption that some developers will make a mistake in adding a component. I mean, at the end of the day, software development is ultimately a very repetitive form of writing. So you have a lot of people typing all the time npm install or editing txts on millions of keyboards. At some point, a typo will happen. Um, there's also a variation of this theme of attackers called brand jacking, uh, but typo scoring is a famous one. Uh, one of the recent attacks that we've uh, seen is um, regarding a Python package that, call, that is called requests. Now, if you look at your keyboards, T and Y are quite close to each other, right? So someone out there went and created some malicious libraries called requests, requesters with R and requester. Uh, the developer who tried to was intended to uh, install requests. Obviously, if they just put their fingers a bit wrong, they would potentially um, download this one of these libraries, which is actually ransomware. Uh, particularly, the version of requests uh, would go into the Windows user folders, like documents, downloads, and it will start encrypting files. Uh, earlier versions of this library uh, contained the encryption and decryption code in plain text, uh, but later on it was uh, fixed by the attacker. Um, the program was using uh, Python's Fernet module to do the encryption, and then it would actually go and upload the decryption key into the attacker's Discord server. You could go there, actually, if you would join this Discord server, you could actually find your key and um, uh, just download it and decrypt your files. Uh, this request package was downloaded about 258 times. Um, 
and uh, funny fact on the code that this person wrote is that we actually, when we did the analysis, we saw that the PC username Jami, which is likely the username of the person who wrote that. Um, few of the attacks that we mentioned in previous slides, like SolarWinds and CodeCov, involve the injection of malicious source code directly into an open source project repository. This can be done by various ways. Uh, you can steal credentials from a project maintainer. Uh, you can release new versions of a project to a public repository. You can contribute pull requests to a project that includes malicious code. Or you can tamper with open source development tools that inject into downstream applications. With code injections, it is likely that no one knows the malware is there except the person that planted it. This approach allows attacker to set terms upstream and then carry these attacks downstream where the vulnerability has been moved through the supply chain and into the code bases of thousands of companies. Finally, uh, one subvariant of malicious code injections that uh, we've seen in the last 12 months or so is protestware. In this scenario, a maintainer deliberately sabotages their own project to cause harm or disruption to, the, to its adopters. Uh, the emergence of these type of campaigns opened the door to an interesting dialogue about what constitutes reckless irresponsibility versus sometimes a seemingly harmless functionality change by a developer. Well, technically it is the maintainer's right to do whatever they want with their code, the disruption caused the users inflicting significant harm and delay may not necessarily have been the intended outcome. The emergence of these types of protest releases has caused an actual debate, and a healthy debate that is, uh, as they're often performed in support of causes like the war or due to the maintainer feeling that, you know, they're not properly compensated for their efforts. Whether the cause is legitimately or not, it highlights the needs for consumers of open source to be ready for this eventuality. And let's go to our last poll question for today. Uh, which is, what do you think, uh, no, which of the following um, ecosystems do you think are the most vulnerable in the open source software? So we mentioned Python in the slides, but what do you think is the biggest? Oh. Yes, very nice. People actually voted correctly. Um, it is JavaScript. Um, but let's see how big. <laughs> so, even though there are risks involved with the open source, uh, the supply of open source is increasing. Um, .NET, for example, uh, we, although we did see a decline in 5% of the projects, um, it's still very high at about 6 million versions and uh, almost 400,000 projects. But then Python, we've seen an 18% project increase and 700 thousand new versions added. JavaScript, 9% project increase and a whooping 8 million of new versions. And finally, in Java, we saw a 14% project increase and over 2 million new versions added to the already 7.3 million versions out there. So it's not only the supply that's increasing, but it's also the demand of open source. Although the overall average growth rate of open source consumption has slowed from the 2021 all-time high of 73% to a more moderate estimate of 33%, the overall download volume across the four major ecosystems is now projected to top 3 trillion downloads overall. Java is on a 36% year-on-year growth with about 675 billion packages projected. JavaScript grows 32 year over year, but it's now projected to top 2.1 trillion downloads overall. 
The NPM ecosystem in particular is set to serve nearly as many downloads in 2022 as all the four ecosystems combined in 2021. It's staggering. Python has grown 41% with an estimated of 176 uh, billion downloads. And finally, .NET, uh, we've seen a 23% growth with 96 billion downloads. So as you can see, the growth is absolutely there. The important thing that we've seen is that vulnerability is largely a consumption side problem. Consumption means the people that are actually using open source. What we've seen is for about 96 of vulnerable downloads that people have downloaded or organizations have downloaded, there is a non-vulnerable version available. That, of course, that doesn't mean it has been used, right? So let's sum it up. Although open source involves risk, it's still being used today heavily by organizations and for good reasons. But there are ways to mitigate these risks. So how is that? Well, as the operators of Maven Central and a security intelligence team that stands more than 100 people strong, this is what we think should be the best practices for its organization. First of all, for developers, one-click recommendations with all the right information on how to mitigate. Delivered at the right time, thus allowing security to be built in and not an afterthought. So shift left as much as possible and in the right place by integrating with popular ideas. For security, continuous security research allowing you to see more vulnerabilities with the most detailed knowledge base. End-to-end -end policy control allowing you to scale more by auto-enforcing policies early and everywhere across the software development lifecycle. And of course, prevent known and unknown risk from entering your SDLC. For operations, allowing them to have a precise software bill of materials, continuous monitoring of applications in production because we know things change every day, and visibility to quickly respond to zero days the moment they are reported. And finally, for legal, easily enforce licensing policy at scale, easily understand specific license obligations, simplify and automate proper attribution reporting. And of course, finally, align all teams across the entire software development lifecycle by controlling, defining, and enforcing policies without slowing innovation and go to market. That's all for our presentation today. So let's see if we have any questions. So we have a question about typo squatting, if it is easy to detect happening. Uh, absolutely. I mean, if you have the right tools in place, everything is easy. Absolutely. Um, it's, um, for example, as Sonotype, we, we have multiple ways to detect that you can get as an example, you can even get a browser plugin when a developer is looking at libraries, what he's going to use, looking at the um, manuals or anything, they can see if this library is safe or not. And the moment we detect a type of scoting uh, attack, a library that is not what they're supposed to do, we can actually detect it the moment it tries to download into your pipeline and stop it there. So it stops before entering your SDLC. Any other questions, anybody? Looks like we got no more questions. Cool. We actually have one more question, Guy. Let's just oh, come up. Right. Where is the SSCR kept? Uh, sorry, what, what do you mean by that? You can type some elaboration on this one. Oh, the report. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, 
So the software supply, we, so the software supply chain report, I think Vanessa, you can follow up on this one. Yeah, so we, we are happy to share the software supply chain report. It's a free read. It's an interesting read as well. And it's a big read as well. So uh, it has very interesting stats. Uh, you'll see a lot of uh, trends that uh, are already happening this year and they're going to continue happening for next year. So uh, Vanessa is going to follow up with the, uh, with the report. Yeah, it'll be in the follow-up email along with the recording of this session as well. So you'll be able to review this again. I'll share it with colleagues and the report link will be in there for you to have a look at. Does anybody have any more questions? But even if you don't have the questions now, if you remember them later, please contact us. We'll be happy to follow up with any now. Perfect. I think well, that'll do for today then. Um, so yeah, thank you again for everyone for joining. We hope you found that really useful. Like we've mentioned, the session was recorded so we can send it out again. So feel free to share it with your colleagues um, anybody that might be interested. And we'll also, like I said, the report link will be on there for you to have a look at. But yeah, in the meantime, please reach out to these guys or reach out to us direct with any other questions and we'll get back to you with the answers. And thanks guys for doing such a great job. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.